Our bodies have developed a beautiful, dynamic system to maintain glucose levels. Whether you're hiking a mountain, doing a dance, or snuggling a poodle, it all relates back to supply and demand. What glucose is coming in? What do we have in storage? And what are the demands of the system? Eating carbs supplies the body with glucose. Exercise demands glucose as fuel. But here's the thing, that timing of supply and demand impacts our metabolism, and manipulating that timing can impact health. How does it all work? Let's science it. Hey, welcome to Nourishful, I'm Dr. Lara. To get some data on how exercise timing impacts blood glucose responses, I've designed a little N of one experiment. Each day, I'll drink an identical smoothie for breakfast. One day, I'll refrain from exercising before or for two hours after my smoothie. One day, I'll exercise immediately after my smoothie, and the other day, I'll exercise immediately before. I'm using a continuous glucose monitor, which measures a proxy of my blood glucose every five minutes. Good morning, it's day one of my experiment, and today I'm just drinking the smoothie with no exercise. And the goal of today's setup is to get a sense of my postprandial glycemic response. Prandial meaning eating, post meaning after, glycemia referring to blood glucose. So what happens to my blood glucose response after I drink my smoothie? And I've prepared for today by trying to reduce other factors that would impact my blood glucose response. So I have fasted for 12 hours overnight, I haven't had any alcohol in the past 24 hours, and I avoided super strenuous physical activity yesterday. My test smoothie is a personal favorite with baby spinach, frozen blueberries, banana, unflavored kefir, cashew nut butter, and a bit of water to make it drinkable. This yields 50 grams of total carbs, with eight of those grams being fiber. Here is my data. Along the x-axis, we have time in minutes, and along the y-axis, we have my glucose level in milligrams per deciliter. This is my fasting glucose at time zero. We see that my glucose levels start to rise about 20 minutes after drinking the smoothie, then it peaks at 45 minutes and returns to baseline around 75 minutes. To understand what's going on here physiologically, we need to understand something about cells. Glucose is delivered to cells through the blood. But this glucose can't just diffuse directly into cells. And that's because the cell membrane isn't permeable to glucose. Glucose is just too big and too polar to get across the cell membrane. To get into the cell, glucose needs a special doorway that is perfectly shaped to allow glucose through. This doorway is a protein called GLUT4, or glucose transporter 4. When GLUT4 is in the membrane, then glucose slides through to, in, to get into the cell. But when GLUT4 is absent, then glucose is trapped outside. GLUT4 was discovered in 1988, the year the Jamaican bobsled team debuted at the Olympics in my hometown of Calgary. Those Jamaican bobsledders, they relied on GLUT4 to fuel their muscles with energy. So here's the thing, GLUT4 isn't always in the cell membrane. Often, it's stored in little balloon-like vesicles inside cells, all ready to go. Inserting GLUT4 into the membrane requires a signal from the hormone insulin. Insulin is a hormone secreted by the pancreas when the blood glucose concentration increases. The goal of insulin is to lower glucose levels by signaling to cells to insert their pre-made GLUT4s into the membrane, so then the cells can take in glucose from the blood. Looking at this graph, during the first 45 minutes, I was digesting and absorbing the carbs from my smoothie, causing a rise in my blood glucose. Around here, my pancreas secreted the hormone insulin. That insulin then triggered my muscle and fat cells to insert their pre-made GLUT4s into the membrane. This decrease in my blood glucose back to baseline reflects my muscle and fat cells taking in glucose from the blood through GLUT4. So that's my baseline postprandial response to the smoothie. We see a rise, but not a super huge or super fast spike due to the fiber, protein, and fat content of the smoothie, which slows down the digestion and absorption of the carbs. I really wanted to measure for a full two hours after, but the sensor pooped out 20 minutes shy. What was going on after this is a bit of a mystery, but it does look like it had normalized back to baseline. Mm -hmm. 
It's day two of my experiment, and today I'm doing my bout of exercise before drinking my smoothie. I'm doing a high intensity interval training session as my test exercise. This one is called Sports Conditioning from the Johnson & Johnson 7 Minute Workout App. Here's my data for day two in purple. Time along the x-axis, glucose level along the y-axis. Time zero is when I drank my smoothie after I finished exercising. We actually see a bit of a dip, and then there really isn't a discernible peak. And then it drops off to a level lower than my starting baseline. Compared to just drinking the smoothie yesterday in blue, it's pretty different. The exercise has blunted the glucose spike. But what is also interesting is that my glucose level at time zero is higher than my fasting level from yesterday. We can get a bit more insight if we look at my glucose levels while I was actually exercising before drinking the smoothie. This was my fasting level before I started exercise, so pretty similar to my fasting level in blue. Then when I start exercising, we actually see my glucose level rise a bit. That's because my muscles required extra fuel. The muscle started off by using its own personal storage of glycogen. Glycogen is a whole bunch of glucose units all bound together. When the muscle needs fuel, it can break apart the glycogen and shuttle glucose towards generating energy. Now the muscle needs to get more glucose from the blood. And it turns out that contracting muscles causes those GLUT4 doorways to get inserted into the membrane without any help from insulin, allowing the muscle to take in glucose from the blood. This is called insulin-independent GLUT4 translocation, because GLUT4 is getting inserted into the membrane without insulin's help. So that's what we see here. We see my glucose level dipping a bit because my exercising muscles are taking in glucose from the blood. Since this exercise was pretty intense, it caused the stress hormone adrenaline to be secreted. Adrenaline triggers the liver to break down some of its glycogen and release glucose into the blood. That's what we see here with the rise in my glucose level during exercise. My glucose was rising because the liver was providing fuel for my working muscle. When I drank my smoothie, my muscles were already taking in glucose through GLUT4, even before insulin was released. As I digested and absorbed my smoothie, this likely triggered a small insulin release, which would help sustain the GLUT4 doorways in my muscle cells. As we look out 95 minutes after drinking my smoothie, we see that my glucose level dropped lower than the smoothie alone day. This is because the exercise made my muscle more insulin sensitive, and it's taking in glucose to replenish the glycogen stores. Compared to day one, when my glucose level decreased due to insulin alone, on day two, my glucose level decreased due to both insulin-dependent and insulin-independent insertion of GLUT4 into my muscle cells. Since my muscle cells were so actively taking in glucose from the blood, there was likely less glucose being taken in by my fat cells. Last day of the experiment, and today I'm drinking my smoothie, then exercising. I'm not looking forward to this. My smoothie is gonna bounce around in my stomach. Here's my data for day three in red. I drank my smoothie at time zero and then immediately started exercising. We see a bit of an upward slope that peaks around 30 minutes, but it's really not much of a spike. Then it normalizes back to baseline by 50 minutes. Physiologically, what's going on here is that my glucose levels started to rise here after I digested and absorbed my smoothie. This stimulates insulin release, which signals muscle and fat cells to insert GLUT4 into their cell membranes. But since I was also exercising, the muscle contractions independently inserted GLUT4 into the membranes too. Since the muscle was taking in so much glucose from the blood to be used immediately as fuel, this blunted the spike we saw with the smoothie alone. 
When we look at all three days together, we see some pretty striking takeaways. Compared to the smoothie alone in blue, exercising either before or after the smoothie really blunted the spike in glucose levels. This is because the exercising muscle more effectively takes in glucose from the blood. And why do we care? Accumulating research has been pointing towards postprandial glycemic responses as a biomarker that matters for health. Studies show that people with lower postprandial glycemic responses, so attenuated spikes and fewer swings, have a lower risk of chronic diseases, like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And that's because frequently exposing ourselves to high levels of glucose initiates inflammation, and chronic inflammation is the first step in disease development. Since exercise around eating dampens the glucose spikes, it has the potential to reduce disease risk in the long run. I think the dampening of my glucose spike with exercise was pretty striking. The way I'm starting to use this information is to incorporate bursts of exercise before eating, especially if I know that I'm gonna be pretty sedentary after my meal. For me personally, I find that starting my day with a dog walk before breakfast and squeezing in a little HIIT workout right before lunch sustainably fits into my schedule. And of course, there are some weaknesses to my little N of 1 experiment. First is that blood glucose dynamics are going to be different depending on the intensity and duration of exercise. So we can't look at my experiment and make generalizations to all types of exercise. Plus, there's a lot of variability between people in their postprandial glycemic responses to food. And there's a whole spectrum of insulin sensitivity levels. But many of the underlying mechanisms, like exercise-induced GLUT4 insertion into muscle cells, are going to be applicable to pretty much everyone. If you're managing diabetes, definitely talk to your personal doctor about strategizing eating and exercise timing. Based on my little N of 1 experiment and other research studies, pairing eating with exercise blunts glucose spikes. That's a good thing. If incorporating bursts of physical activity around eating is feasible for you, then it can be a great strategy to avoid big postprandial spikes in glucose. But one note of caution. I don't want to make perfect the enemy of the good. The most important thing is to be physically active whenever it fits for you. If it's right before or after eating, then great. But if not, that physical activity is still going to be beneficial in oh so many ways. Mentally, physically, metabolically. The one magic pill we have for health is exercise. Plus, exercise enhances insulin sensitivity for up to 24 hours after the bout. So your blood glucose will benefit regardless of when your exercise takes place. So find physical activity that you enjoy doing. That's what science tastes like. Thanks for tuning in to Nourishable. Check out all my references in the video description and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things nutrition.